Hello, it's six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the DNA Interest Group. Uh, it's good to be back at the Iowa City Public Library um, uh, for our February meeting. Uh, next month, and so uh, our March meeting, uh, which is also March 27th as well, um, uh, that meeting is going to be on, on Y chromosomes. Uh, and so that's our next scheduled meeting. Uh, and then our, our April meeting uh, will be focused on uh, the human genome, because uh, that's really DNA day. Uh, it's actually April 24th is our scheduled meeting for this. Uh, but we, we meet monthly here, if you're new, uh, at the Iowa City Public Library each month on the uh, fourth Tuesday of the month, and so 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, and, and so the, the goal of this is to bring together individuals in the community that are interested in the direct consumer DNA market, um, those in the university uh, that are also have interest in that area. And tonight the program uh, is uh, What Are You? Race, race, Ethnicity, and Genetic Testing. Uh, tonight's program is going is, is developed and uh, is going to be delivered to you by a group of students that work with me. I'm Brent McAllister from the Department of Biology at the University. Uh, these are a group of students that work in the Personal Genome Learning Center. Uh, and so a group of students that uh, have interest in the direct-to-consumer market. Uh, and uh, they've developed this program uh, about uh, race, ethnicity, and genetic testing. So tonight's pre presenters are Natasha Anderson, uh, Essence Bayman, uh, uh, Jennifer Farrell, and Zoe Swinton. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Essence, who's going to start us off. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Hello. Uh, as mentioned before, my name is Essence, and today we're going to talk about the relationship between race, ethnicity, and genetic testing, specifically direct-to-consumer tests, which we'll, we'll refer to them as direct-to-consumer, but as you're looking at this presentation, it'll just be abbreviated as DTC because that's a very long phrase. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about how are race and ethnicity defined, um, mostly in the context of the United States because we do race a little differently than other countries do. And then we're going to talk about it socially and scientifically. I also think it's a very important conversation to have in general because Americans talk about race and ethnicity a lot without ever actually defining it. Um, and race and ethnicity can determine lots of things about you, what you maybe what you wear, how you wear your hair, the kind of language you use, what music you listen to. There are lots of things that affect uh, race and ethnicity can affect lots of things in the way that you walk through the world. Uh, then we're going to talk about how do these direct to consumer tests determine ancestry. Um, we'll get more into detail about that. And also how consistent are the way that we socially and scientifically define these classifications and then also how people define themselves versus what others in these tests tell them. Finally, I'd like to make the point that participation is greatly appreciated. Please raise your hand if you have any questions or comments uh, throughout this presentation. It's more of a discussion and not a lecture. Um, so first we're going to talk about what are race and ethnicity. So uh, one of the main purposes of having this conversation is that Kyle's experience is not unique. Many of us that have taken direct-to-consumer genetic tests have gotten results that don't necessarily comply with our oral history, how we identify ourselves, um, or the way that we perceive ourselves. So um, firstly, I'd like to say that if you get results that are different from what you know your identity to be, that's OK. <laughs> you don't have to switch from leader hosen to kilts. <laughs> um, race itself is purely appearance-based in the United States. So, Personally, I identify as a black person, and most people recognize me as such, unless maybe I'm around other people speaking a different language. <laughs> um, ethnicity is based on your cultural connections and personal history. So ethnically, I am an African American. Nationality is based on the nation that you are from. I am an American. Ancestry is based on your genetic composition. I have also taken the direct-to-consumer test, and um, ancestrally, I am 75% West African and 25% European. Um, throughout some of these tests, they will tell you uh, that these are your ethnicity reports and will further explain uh, why it's called ethnicity in this context, even though it doesn't necessarily agree with the social definition for ethnicity. All right, 
So, um, as I'm sure you know, the Constitution mandates that, the U.S. Constitution mandates that a census is taken every 10 years. And so, this started in 1790, and it's obviously still continuing today. But what's interesting about the U.S. Census is that it wasn't until 1960 that people could choose their own race. And so it was chosen for you, and it wasn't until 2000 that you could uh, recognize yourself as more than one. So before 2000, you had to say, okay, I am black. But if, you, if your mom was white and your dad was black, say you had to decide, okay, am I going to put down black or white, and you couldn't check both. And so here is uh, a couple graphics that show you how it's changed over the years. And so you'll notice that in 1790, it was not even just white and black, but it was white and slave. And so it's developed since then. And then um, in addition, there are obviously more races than white and black. And so you can see that on the right side. And you'll notice that um, what people are called also changes on the census. Um, I know for a fact that the Hispanic was included in the 1900s, and then it was taken out for a period of time. And then it was added back in, but now it's no longer considered a race. And so you check, I am Hispanic, and then you check your race. And so there are very, there are very interesting things that go on in the census. Uh, we thought it would be interesting to look at different ways countries outside of the United States defined race and ethnicity, just for comparison. Um, I chose an African country, Liberia, as an example. And you can see that they define, uh, they define race as a belonging to a tribal group within the country. Uh, they also have Americo-Liberians, which are um, American slaves that return to Liberia. In Canada, they define it by your ethnicity, whether you are from British Isles or of French origin or other European. Um, in Brazil, it is purely a, uh, a caste system based on your color, um, how white you are on a scale of white to black. Uh, in reality, we would hope that race is something that is biologically defined, that there is some number of genes inside of you that says this is exactly what skin color you have. Um, in fact, in the human experience, there are at least 3,000 different colors of skin you could have, and these are just the pictures that were taken. In fact, skin color is a very complicated thing that is based on many factors. Scientists used to think that there were maybe nine genes involved, and would you believe it's just been recently that they took samples from African populations and learned there are more than 15 genes at least that are partially involved. Each gene has a small effect. More importantly, whether you're born close to the equator and exposed to a lot of the sun, what altitude that you're um, living at, uh, these are also important factors in what skin color and phenotypic variation can be within parents and children can be very different because of all the genetic factors and environmental factors that go into determining that. So genetic tests uh, vary a lot between different, uh, between different platforms. And if you've ever taken multiple tests, such as Ancestry or 23andMe, you may find that your results do vary. If you are comparing just Ancestry and 23andMe, as you can see, there's quite a few reasons as to why they would vary. For one, 23andMe tests a lot more uh, people for reference populations, uh, about 10,000 people, whereas Ancestry only tests about 3,000 individuals. 23andMe also tests slightly more populations, uh, whereas Ancestry only tests about 26 populations. Um, 23andMe also uh, tests the SNPs slightly differently. They do blocks of SNPs separately, diff or different ones individually, and then compare the total with, uh, you know, someone from, say, Ireland, and then they say, okay, that's your ethnicity. 
Ancestry, however, does independent SNP, SNP analysis where it's one block, for example, and if that matches someone from, say, Germany, then they would say that's your ethnicity. Uh, Ancestry also does not test quite as far back as 23andMe. They only test back to about five generations, whereas 23andMe tests a little bit further than that, as you can see, 500 minimum uh, confirmed Ancestry. The results do vary, as I said, and part of this also has to do with what is considered a reference population, depending on what the platforms determine is Asian versus, uh, you know, Middle Eastern, and that will produce different results. There is also a variety in the sample populations for how many people they test within a population. For example, Ancestry, I know, generally is geared toward the US, and so they have a lot of populations that are a lot more Western European based. 23andMe is a lot more global, and recently when they updated their chip, they in fact uh, made that a lot more equal, made an equal amount, uh, an equivalent amount of people they tested from Asia versus Africa versus Europe. Not all the spots on the DNA, uh, not, all, not all the spots on DNA are tested. Only a very, very small portion is, in fact, just barely even much of it at all. Percentages are estimates. If you get your DNA test back and you get told, you know, you're 20% Irish, it's exactly that, an estimate. There's no real way to say with 100% certainty unless you're looking at uh, papers or you go back far enough with documents to say, I am exactly this percentage of this ethnicity. Additionally, uh, borders, especially in Europe, have been redrawn through wars, through history, just over time. And so, for example, Czechoslovakia is no longer a country. At the time, Czechoslovakia was a country that was what you would identify as. Now there's the Czech Republic and Slovakia, so that would vary. Uh, as you can see, parts of Poland have been added or taken away, so it would depend on the time period of whether you would identify as Polish. Additionally, if you take, for example, 23andMe test for Ashkenazi Jewish. Ashkenazi Jewish is a population that is really spread all over. They are not concentrated, they are not concentrated just in one region of the world, and that is kind of an example of how they aren't testing solely regions, but uh, genetic basis. <laughs> so next, I'd like to talk about how aligned are the classifications of race and ethnicity. And when I say aligned, I mean how consistent is, it, is the way that you identify yourself, the way that other people identify you, and the way that these ethnicity tests identify you. Um, so this is, these two, oh, I have to stay near the mic, sorry guys. <laughs> these two uh, maps show African ancestry and um, 23 and Me participants. So the first map shows African ancestry among self-identified African Americans. Um, the, green, um, the green states have African Americans who identify, who have African ancestry um, in a, right, about the 85% range. And the more pink states have African ancestry in the 65% range. And then the next figure is self-identified white Americans with African ancestry. Um, the range is much smaller. It's from zero to about 14%, but it is very concentrated in a similar area, probably historically uh, due to the concentration of African uh, people descended from African people in that area. But the main purpose of including these figures is that um, there is no magic number to say, uh, to open the gate to being white or to being black. There's no genetic component that entitles you or cuts you out of having that identity, identity racially. Uh, but ancestrally, both of these groups can have African ancestry, and that is the real difference between what a genetic test is telling you and the way you identify. So I'm just going to have a few examples of some people who's uh, identity and the way that the world has perceived them have, like how does that affect them in the way that they move through the world? So Sandra Lang um, was born about five years into apartheid and both of her parents um, have three confirmed generations of white ancestry. 
um, which was the way that we class that we during apartheid that was the way that you were racially pure enough to be considered white before they classified you as some other uh, group. Um, as when Sandra was first born, she was lighter and her hair wasn't as kinky. But as she grew older, more and more people around her noticed that she wasn't what we would assume to be phenotypically white. Um, when she was 10, her parents tried to enroll her in a private school. At the time, it was all white, as during apartheid, the entire country was segregated um, in almost every aspect of life, I believe. And um, they analyzed her hair. At the time, people truly believed that head size and body shape and body height had, uh, were determining factors for your race. So they also examined her in that way. And after all of that, um, she was escorted by police away from the campus because they had determined that she was not white, even though her parents had papers to prove that her ancestry was white and that both of them were her biological parents. Lacey Schwartz is a different case. Lacey Schwartz um, is biracial and her mother had an affair, but Lacey was not notified of this until she was about 18. And so for most of Lacey's life, she believed that she was white, although other people around her were consistently telling her that you don't look white to us, and are you really sure? And her parents came up with the, uh, the lie, because even her parents knew that it wasn't true, but her parents came up with the story that she had a Sicilian Jewish grandfather who was uh, on the darker side and had curlier hair, and that was their explanation for why she looked so different. Lacey found out the truth and went on to make a documentary uh, called Little White Lie about what that experience has been like. And uh, a very interesting quote for her is, I truly know what it's like to live life as a white person and as a black person. <laughs> um, Rachel Dolezal uh, has, was very recently popular in the news because she, has, she is a white woman um, from what we see. <laughs> but identifies as black, she believes that race is on a continuum, that it's a spectrum, that you can be transracial, which is a real term and has different implications, but not necessarily in the way that she presents it. Um, her parents have confirmed her ancestry is Czech, Native American, and German. Rachel Dolezal refuses to give any true statements about whether or not she is white or black, but also um, publicly has stated that she will not apologize for the role that she played. She began presenting as a black woman when she was the president of the NAACP Spokane chapter. And for her, it was a way to be, uh, a way for her to more success successfully help the black community by becoming a black person. Um, president Obama is, oh, sorry. <laughs> president Obama is biracial, but most of us are um, knowing him as our first black president. And Obama's experience with race was a little different because he grew up in Hawaii and his mother was white. And for him, it wasn't so apparent that he presented as black and that some people would treat him differently from, uh, because of that until he got to the continental states and was trying to, an example that he gave was he was trying to get a cab and no one would stop for him. And it took a minute to click as to why. <laughs> um, but for him, race has never been just that apparent. And um, being biracial wasn't, he's always identified as black. And uh, for the 2010 census, he marked off black. And he, he identifies that way, but it wasn't very apparent to him what implications that would have for him socially until he came uh, here for college. Uh, Princess Meghan Markle has been in the news lately because she will be one of the first um, black people to be a British royalty because she's marrying into the royal family. But that's the label of black is being given to her by other people because Meghan does not identify as such. Meghan has one black parent and one white parent, but she identifies as biracial and doesn't believe that she should have to choose one or the other. And um, also, many people don't see her as black in some instances. Some people, the term is white passing where you are a person of a certain ethnicity or race, but 
you could pass for a white person. And in some contexts, she does, which leads to lots of disagreement about whether or not it is substantial to have her as the first black princess if she isn't what a lot of people phenotypically uh, attribute to blackness. Senator Elizabeth Warren is also somebody who has been in the news lately uh, relative to um, ancestry testing. She, uh, her mother is uh, self-identified as from a Cherokee tribe and she tells a story about how her father's family was very upset about him marrying uh, a Cherokee woman. Um, she gives an example that she identifies as a Native American woman. She realizes she's not a member of a tribe and that tribal membership is at the discretion of the tribe who they accept on that registry. Um, it's interesting because the Republican National Committee issued a statement blasting her as Focahontas publicly for uh, what they say that she was not showing up to a major Na Native American summit. But when she has reached out to groups of Native American people in the United States, they have um, described her stories as very moving, uh, very touching, and they sympathize that even within Native American tribes, tri tribal identity is a complicated issue. You may belong to multiple tribes or, or have multiple links to your heritage. One of the uh, issues that has been uh, in the news recently, and many of us may have seen it on our DNA interest page, is the Cheddar Man. Uh, for the first time, we've been able to do some forensic testing using DNA to identify what uh, people's physical features looked like. And so through a DNA extraction of an ancient 10,000-year-old skeleton, we were able to reconstruct what a man from 10,000 years ago who was a native of Britain looked like. And this identifies that being a light-skinned European is a relatively recent phenomena. Uh, the 23andMe was able to get information about his mitochondrial DNA, his maternal haplogroup, and identify that he belonged to the group U5A. And everyone who was with 23andMe and was a member of this group received a lot of good information from 23andMe about being related to Cheddar Man. Uh, we are lucky enough in our DNA interest group to have a Cheddar Woman <laughs> who shared this information with us. Uh, this is Arianna Thomas, and you probably re remember her from our Doggy DNA Day. Uh, she is, uh, she shares that maternal haplogroup with the very famous Cheddar Man. Okay, so I'm sure we all do it. Uh, we assume people's ethnicities uh, when we see them. And there's somewhat of a discussion about people being colorblind when it comes to race or ethnicity. And we just want to point out that that's not necessarily, that is not a good thing. Um, this is a discussion that needs to be, race and ethnicity are important and they should be part of a discussion and we all have identities and being blind to them isn't beneficial really for anyone. We're gonna play a game. <laughs> so Jenny is over here, she's also right there. What do you guys think she is? Trying to give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take guesses. Essence has a microphone, so if anyone wants to guess, remember this is an important discussion, so like go ahead and make the guess. <laughs> Hiawegian. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyone else? And remember, people can have multiple. Um, identities to or multiple races, so. Swedish. 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 <laughs> okay. Anyone else have a guess? That's no? actually pretty. All right. So this is what she is. I am about 50% British and Irish. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, I'm about 50% British and Irish, which is what I know about myself. My dad and his family are all from Scotland, uh, emigrated. But as we all know, uh, the, the Scottish population is very highly interweaved with Scandinavian, and I'm holding a Royal Danish cigar there in tribute to that. <laughs> all right. So next, we have me. Um, I might be a little bit harder, and I only say that because I get the what are you question a lot. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any guesses? I've probably heard them all. Filipino. Filipino. Okay. Anyone else? Southern European. Southern European. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I've definitely heard. We're having fun. We're talking about race. Yeah. I mean, I had a list at one point of like 20 different guesses people have made about me. So probably more than two that could be made. Native American. I've gotten that before. All right. So um, I'm Irish, um, British, Scottish. The only thing that's not very European. I guess it is still definitely European. But Ancestry.com says that I'm about 6% from the Iberian Peninsula. So that'd be about Spain. So that might attribute to my darker complexion. However, 23andMe said I'm like 2% or something like that. 2%. Yep. So I've gotten Mexican, Latina a lot, Asian, like Filipino. Um, yeah. So Middle Eastern I got last week. So it just shows that you can't really uh, tell. But we have a couple other guesses, or a couple other people. So what do you think she is? She's part of our group. And she was reluctant to send her picture because it was so obvious that everybody would guess it right yeah. off the bat. We're not trying to be tricky. I know mine was harder, but any guesses? Russian? European. European. All right. 100% European. Um, Balkan, mostly. All right. I believe we have one more, maybe two more. Scottish or Irish? German. <laughs> Okay, he looks like a European. That's what she said. So Derek is 80% European, but he is also 20% Sub-Saharan African. So there's his picture again. Yeah. And then um, one more Natasha. <laughs> you might remember her. Any guesses? Yeah. <laughs> I was paying attention. <laughs> Any guesses? Asian, Native American. All right. So as you can see, this is my ancestry results. And I am 60% Eastern European, uh, about 20% South Asian, and about 17% Central Asian. I mostly get uh, Mexican. Chinese, Serbian, Italian, Indian, and a couple others. In fact, uh, in my fourth year Spanish teacher called me over and asked if I spoke Spanish at home. That's happened to me too. Yeah. Um, so I was adopted from Russia, hence the Eastern European. And the rest was, well, it's up there. <laughs> Uh, so just to conclude, like there is no, once again, there's no magic number, there's no magic percentage for how you're going to look based on your ancestry. And it's okay to have these kind of conversations. I think they're really productive because then we get to know each other better, have better conversations about race, and also the scientific implications for genetic testing. Are there any questions? Or comments? Yes? I think you said right, right, right. Oh, you got to, yeah. You know, at certain points in time, others assign your race or classification to you. 
uh, on my mother's birth certificate, and she's Middle Eastern, the birth certificate says under race, dark. Wow. So I thought that was an unusual classification, and I don't know how many other physicians use the same word. I have never heard of someone just saying dark. It's kind of close to a slur that I know. <laughs> um, very unusual. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have something with that. So um, in Brazil, like Jenny talked about, it's based on kind of what you look like. And so in one of my classes, we talked about how it changes depending on what room you're in. So if I was in a room with someone, with a bunch of people with paler skin, I would be considered something darker. They have different names for it, but I don't know what they are. So I'd be considered something darker than what I am. And then if I'm in a room with people who are more skin tones like Essence, then I would be considered white. And so it completely changes like, based on the context. Any other questions? Is there any truth? I think I've heard that in Brazil, the richer you are, the lighter your skin gets. Is it, I mean, where it's a political thing rather than you can be black and then if you get more money, you get, you know, you're, you're, you have some different name or, you know, is that, I mean, so that's just another way that, that nationalities or skin race is a term. Yeah, so, exactly, so race is a construct. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Or personal stories that people want to share with Ooh, their own yeah. ancestry and what they discovered? Well, just a note. I guess also with that, like a lot of countries that have uh, significant populations that, uh, African pop, like African descendant populations that aren't in Africa, um, tend to have lots of residual effects from colonization and racism because that's how they were able to control things in those countries, especially because a lot of them. Uh, use plantation labor. So in some ways, like, I don't know if in Brazil it's like an automatic thing, but definitely there's lots of um, ways that race and class, even in America, are really strongly linked because of our history with slavery. So in some ways, lighter skin does buy you better opportunities. to go into the genetics about the complexion, about the uh, about skin color, how they determined that with Cheddar Man? There, there are certain um, forensic markers that you can determine race, or that you can determine ethnicity. Um, but as far as your exact skin color, it is not genetic. You, you can have all of the markers, but that doesn't tell you how light or dark, how that melanin necessarily was expressed. Well, so this is sort of a romance then, what they've talked about in terms of the skin color of ancient there, there, There are, he, he has, oh. she's asking if this was um, just a, a kind of a romance or a fantasy saying that Cheddar Man is, um, has darker skin, and I, I believe they use not just um, genetic factors about his skin, but genetic factors about his skull shape, and other things that would be linked to, like his hair type. The, um, there's just other indicators that are associated with that color skin, and in those situations. Yes. <laughs> So, I mean, there, there are some variants known uh, that uh, uh, are common to, to northern Europeans that have, have lighter skin. And so there's several different variants that have been identified among humans uh, that, that have lightened the skins within North America. And essentially what they did in that testing of the DNA from Cheddarman is look for those variants associated with lighter skin of northern Europeans, and they did not find those, those unique variants. Um, uh, they found the ancestral form of those particular genes uh, that would be associated with darker skin color. And so that's the case of, of identifying, in the, in, in the instance of Cheddarman, at 10,000 years ago when he had died in Britain, that skin color was not lightly pigmented 
uh, at least for Helm at that time. It's actually a more recent uh, set of studies that came out on some, some RK examples. And what they did was go into some um, uh, preserved specimens across the British Isles. And they essentially show, uh, I forget the time frame, it's about um, uh, 700 or 7,000 to about 5,000 BC. There was this transition uh, uh, increasing those light uh, pigmented skin variants uh, within the British Isles. And so that was a very fairly recent and, and rapid transition to lighter skin pigmentation that you saw within the peoples of Britain. And so, and so it's a case of just looking for those variants and then, and then classifying uh, in the case of the Cheddarmen, which Are ones are there. Uh, well, it, it was uh, it was in a, it was actually uh, in association with uh, the movement of peoples out of northern Asia into the into northern uh, Europe and into Britain, um, and so uh, it was it was this fairly recent migration from northern Asia across northern Europe and into Britain. Okay. So not the agrarian; uh, these are sort of the warriors out of Asia as they migrated into Europe. The blue eyes were much right. So, and then the eye color was the other variant that they were looking at. I think selection was involved in the, the change in the frequency of the variants too. So, so people with certain variants were at a selective advantage for lighter skin than. So, is that um, where people tan? I mean, one of our sisters. Uh, always got such a dark tan and people would say, oh, she's, you must have some black, you know, in the park. <laughs> but I, but I, I with, with the, um, she was uh, 50, according to Ancestry, 58%. That was more than any other nor, uh, Northern European. Um, personally, growing up, I also believe the myth that black people don't tan. Uh, until I did, and I also sunburned. <laughs> and I was very confused as to how I, I, I didn't know what it was because I didn't, people said that black people don't burn, but we do. And um, whether or not you're capable of burning or uh, tanning is genetic, and it doesn't necessarily indicate your like ancestry or um, what ethnic groups you could have connections to. As we look at uh, race and ethnicity, especially in this country, uh, the importance in many ways seems to be more as how you operate or are operated on within our country, that your appearance or your, um, your experiences in growing up, because as you grow up in different parts of the uh, country, you come with uh, different kinds of expectations, may well affect how you operate. Uh, one example that I know of is from a uh, uh, young black man who was a friend of our son, uh, but who grew up in Iowa City. When he went to college, he first went down to Morehouse, I believe, in Atlanta, at one of the premier black schools. Uh, he was there for no more than one year, maybe only one semester, because he had been, uh, grew up in Iowa City, was in Iowa City, he was an Iowan uh, by his culturalization and did not fit into the, the culture there. So there's a lot more to it than just how you look. It's also where you grew up, and, and so some people say that uh, race from a, you might say genetic or from, from a DNA standpoint is immaterial, it only becomes important when in the culture it cares about it. That's a very good point. Yeah, um, actually in one of my classes today, we talked about how the United States has used race in order to gain material things, in order to boost their economy or to gain land. And so we specifically talked about Hawaii because you might be familiar with the one drop rule where in the continental United States, well in the United States, um, if you have one drop of African American ancestry, then you are considered black 
right? And so that's how they use it up until 1960. If you had that one drop, then you were that race, and that's what they marked down. Um, however, in Hawaii, you have to be exactly 50%, quantifiably, to be considered Hawaiian, which meant that they could lower the amount of native peoples in Hawaii to make it more acceptable to the government to take over the land. And so there are many ways that race changes even within one country in order to gain things like you were talking about. Any other questions? A student of mine did some research uh, which she felt was fairly valid that among African Americans there is bias by color that the lighter uh, colored African Americans will speak and behave poorly towards the darker colored African Americans. What, is your, what are your thoughts about that? Um, colorism is a theory and a concept and I do believe that um, I don't look at it necessarily that lighter skinned people will treat you differently but that race in America is about your proximity or distance to whiteness and the closer you are the, to whiteness, the like more social capital you have. So the more access to certain schools, the access to certain social groups, access to certain people and experiences, um, the, the beneficial ones, uh, if you are lighter, you may be entitled to some of those things. Of course, the way, and, and it's about, saying that it's about proximity to whiteness, there are other social cues about your appearance that might like make someone think whether or not you are black, like um, your hair texture or maybe the shape of your nose. And I think all of those things, once again, relate back into like, well, how close to being white are you? And in this country, white is superior, white is the majority, and white, being white gives you access to a lot of things historically and present day. This is not about the uh, subject of the evening, but I have to commend our presenters this evening because they uh, do a very good job of presenting their subjects, they uh, talk well on their feet. I think they've done a wonderful job of uh, prevent presenting the subject tonight. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to commend our audience to being open to this subject. It is yes. not easy to talk about, and we appreciate you engaging us. <laughs> Thank you.